You always knew he'd get hurt, but you never, I never thought Danny would be paralyzed. You know, he's one of those guys that always landed on his feet. I knew he'd get scratched up, knew he'd break arms and stuff like that, but when one of the craziest guys that pulls off some of the gnarliest shit gets paralyzed, it really, it makes you think of your own mortality. It was obvious that all Magoo ever wanted to do was race. He rode the bikes harder than anybody could ride them, faster probably than anybody could ride them. It was flashy, it was fast, it was stupid. You know, the, the, Magoo, the Magoo story is a legendary story for, for anybody involved in motorcycles. Danny's a country boy, raised in Forest Hill, California, not far from Lake Tahoe. Before freestyle, there was Magoo. For Danny Magoo Chandler, nicknamed for the nearsighted cartoon character because of past failures to keep the bike straight. I mean, it's Rolling Stones and rock and roll. It's Danny Magoo Chandler in motocross. The way to describe it was, was like controlled chaos. Everybody in Northern California wanted to try to ride like Danny could ride. Me being like a flat stallion with blinders on, you know, just all I ever do was wide open. Danny lived, lived life hard on the track and off. Look at the move by Chandler, fantastic, he takes the Did lead. Did the last pancake one hand or not, that was still the all time. The checkered flag for Danny McCoo Chandler. Well, here's a little bit of my life, huh? I mean, the rear of the bike was out at a 45 degree angle almost half the time it seemed. Weren't you ever worried you were gonna lose it? No, I never was worried I'm gonna lose it. I was just, you know, pushing my limit and I guess that's what you gotta do to win. I was born October 5th, 1959. I am the son of Mary Jane Chandler and Daniel E. Chandler. My mother was a Missouri girl. My father was a Kansas boy, and he got in a car wreck. 
broke his leg, and he had it amputated, cut off right below the knee. So I guess he moved out to California, him and mom, so that he could go to work, because he couldn't be a farmer no more. So yeah, my father had a nickname for everybody. My sister was born Tanya. Before my brother was even riding on his own, he was uh, quite the panty waist. He was a scared little brat. They used to accuse my dad of trying to kill him. She was born with red hair. My mother had red hair. My father always called mom red, so my sister was born with red hair, and he called her Little Red. My dad would go through a ditch or up a hill, and he'd say, you know, let's go. I can't make it. I can't make it. Yeah, you can. No, you're trying to kill me, Dad. You're trying to kill me. Oh, just that kind of stuff. He was such a baby, such a canny waste. I could outride him so bad, it was pitiful. And then I was born, and uh, he said I looked like a little Magoo. I couldn't see. I was a fat little guy, ugly, but he started calling me Magoo. When he was younger, I do know that uh, he would you know, just ride out on the trails with my dad, and he got better and better. My dad loved racing motorcycles. Of course, he had one leg, so you know he wasn't that great. <laughs> Heck, he wasn't very good at all, I don't think. I can remember one time uh, we were at an enduro. We were at the halfway of the gas check. Dad came in and uh, didn't have his leg, and his leg had fallen off. He finished the race, and uh, you know, I couldn't believe it. It was his very first mini bike race. He was laughing all the other kids. My very first race, uh, I think I was nine years old, Triple M Raceway. I rode around the last place. I can remember my dad come out there, started waving me on and I gassed it up and, and I won the damn thing. First time I ever kissed a girl was at my very first motocross race and after that I was addicted. I started, started winning races so I could kiss the trophy girl. First time I ever saw this guy, my dad took me to an enduro in Forest Hill, California. I see this crazy little maniac, long red hair, on a stingray bicycle with a banana seat, whipping it beyond, beyond flat. Everything I learned to do on a motorcycle, I learned how to do on a bicycle. <laughs> and I didn't even have a motorcycle yet. I guess he didn't either, obviously. We were still on stingrays then, but that's my first memory of Magoo. I think the next time I saw him, he was probably 13 or 14 and they were propping him up on a 250CZ, an uh, old Placerville, old motocross in Placerville, California. Had a milk crate for one leg and the other leg barely touched the foot pegs. He actually got on the top of the shed and did a belly dive, thought he could fly. Oh yeah, he was quite, he was quite the, the adventure. I knew Magoo when he was a pup. Pops used to straddle the back of the bike at the starting line for him when he was first starting out because he couldn't touch the ground. After that, uh, got a Steens. You ever seen a Steens? Hodaka motor. It's got like a leaning link front end, you know what I'm talking about? All heavy. Yeah, I even raced uh, Indian. I guess that was like 1971, 72. He got in trouble for being a sm smart and off and, and doing tricks and stuff because my dad thought he should be much more serious, but no, he liked to go out and show off and play cross it up, and give him the peace sign. We were sitting there at the riders meeting at the uh, Lars Larson Motocross School, and this I hear this bike, I don't know how big it was, it was a big motorcycle, I don't know how big it was, it was a big motorcycle. And this guy comes flying by, and looks over at us, sets it down, comes flying back by our riders group, doing like a one-handed wheelie looking over at us. And Lars Larson looks at all of us people in the class and goes, crazy fucking Americans, and it was Bob Grossi. <laughs> yeah. It was Bob Grossi and that big old TM <laughs> oh, Suzuki. Oh, the And ever since that day, I had to have a TM Suzuki. I got my TM in 74. That thing, I broke it in half so many times. There's my 1975 125 Elsinore. Now that's when I started going fast. That's right, when I went expert, that was a good bike. Always crashed. Rode with bent bars all the time. Oh, Magoo was like wild. He kept breaking the bike, you know? He had the style, but the thing always broke. I remember his little leather seat. I don't know if Nancy Lee built that for you or whatever, but it was like a little leather CZ seat, you know, just with the flaps and everything as a stock. We were like, where'd you get that? Went to this race, the White Rock, California. Saw this guy doing these big one-handed wheelies and long hair hanging out the back of his helmet, and he's riding his 250 CZ. 
I like this guy. His name was Brad Lackey. You know, like somebody said the other day, I forget how they put it, but you know, back when men were men and bikes were junk. You know, because yeah. basically, it you know, we were developing them, we were breaking them. You know, to have Buchanan wheels and spokes and shit now that the bikes have that don't ever blow up. Yeah. Somebody had to blow up a few wheels to get to that point, and that was Danny and me and, and a few other guys. I could go out and blow up five wheels. Yeah, me. exactly. Really, my first experience with it was when he um he came up to our house up in North San Juan to get some leathers made, and um I remember seeing his bike all short and the seat all real low and everything and. And uh, my mom made him a set of leathers, and so I've known him forever. You know, followed his career. He's one of the first guys I got to paint his helmets for, and kind of supported everything I did, which was really cool. You know, really put, put, helped put our company on the map. Turned professional at 16. First pro race was at Plymouth, California, 1976. Uh, the first moto. I was like third or fourth place and uh, wadded up real hard. Uh, Danny was one of the other guys that jumped on big bikes at a young age because there really wasn't a big amateur thing back then. So a lot of guys in Southern California and Northern California would, would go to pro as soon as they could. So. He, he stood apart. I mean, this is the first guy that ever did a double jump. First guy that the average person could could relate to the working class man, you know, that wasn't a factory rider and, and did things that had never been done before. I mean, it was just fucking incredible. You're seeing a motocross taken to a new new level. Everybody talked about this you know, mysterious Magoo, how that at any time he was the fastest guy in the world and but always had the big crashes and was inconsistent and stuff like that. I remember at Marysville, and where it was always fun to watch you was you'd come off of the dropaways, and you wouldn't just, you know, drop down. You'd be sideways. When you'd hit the ground on that thing, it had roost 40 feet in the air, and you'd go like a bullet, just out and just gone. You know, ever since I was a little boy, nine years old, you know, trophy girls, it's no excuse, but I liked his girls. Sure. And, and you were a person who were always there with me, Billy. I mean, I watch riders and mechanics today. They don't play together, you know, and we played together and it was, that was the best way to learn. Well, there was, there was no doubt that uh, Danny was the most aggressive rider on the track and uh, he had no quit in him. He was just, he would give it 100% always. And you never had to worry as a, as a mechanic that he was gonna go out there and be half-hearted. He was gonna give it his all every time. And, and that's just the way he was. Danny had more heart than any rider I've ever worked for or any rider I ever saw. In 1976, I was my first year on the Nationals, and we had a cement company, uh, some local friends, Elk Grove Ready Mix. They agreed to buy me two motorcycles and pay, uh, give me $15,000 cash to do my first year on the Nationals. We were at a National in St. Louis, Missouri, and I met this guy in the pits, B.J. Ertley and he owned a motorcycle shop in Pittsburgh, Kansas. And we got to talking with him. He would go to all, all around Arkansas and Nebraska and Kansas City and talk to promoters about paying, you know, like four or $500 just to show up. And then there would be a $3,000 purse. So he gave me a 125, a 250, and a 500. And uh, that sponsored my second year on the Nationals. So it would be my father, who was a man who smoked two, two packs of cigarettes a day, living in a van with a, another man who was the same age, who hated cigarettes, and he loved country music, and my dad hated music and loved his CB radio. Now imagine a 16-year-old kid and a 40-year-old man, another 40-year-old man, fighting over the CB and the radio and then arguing over cigarettes when you could smoke and when you couldn't smoke, you know, for what, five months? Oh. I went to Sears Point to watch him do one of the, you know, outdoor motocrosses they used to run out there on the hills and, uh, he was pretty impressive riding that Mako, just flat stick the whole way. And uh, I often wonder what he would be able to do with the stuff that we're on, you know, now today, because he was this crash blower 
put a hole in the wall kind of attitude. Mako days. Billy called up and said uh, he had a Mako here for me to ride. I think we went, the first series we did was uh, Golden State, wasn't it? Uh, California yeah, we series. we won the 250 championship that year. Yeah, then uh, Mako approached us and... Uh, well, I remember we had a bidding contest with KTM and Mako. Yeah, if you could call and, it that. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was. was. It would have been. It but was, but it wasn't a lot of money in those days, but, I guess it was. Uh, they offered me like $27,000 and plus expenses yeah. and a box truck. Yeah, and they a, offered us factory bikes from Germany, works bikes. Right. That was when it was three motos, you know, and you got 10 laps. You know, now you go to the races and you sit around all day and you get four laps, one minute lap time, so. There came a point when I, we got this dog. This blue tick hound dog. Yeah, buddy. We would go to, you know, like Redbud, Michigan or something. We'd been testing or riding, and uh, I would take off for a little run, just as a game, and uh, try to outrun the dog. I'd take off for like, you know, 40 minute run, and you'd let the dog go like 10 minutes after I took off running, and uh, that dog would catch me. That's how I believe I really started training. And then at 21, I really started applying it. I started lifting. I, I mean, it was like a like a video game to me. I just plug it in and I watched Billy run. I watched how Billy did setups. I mean, I started getting in <laughs> shape and I started whipping everybody's ass. Uh, a lot of people used to say he was crazy. I never thought he was crazy because the things he would try and the things he would do were things he was capable of doing. And he always did things that uh, other people couldn't do, but they didn't have the talent he had. Yeah, Saddleback Park and Magoo, Magoo Double, he was always the first guy to try everything. The way to describe it was, was like controlled chaos. It was either a make or break situation with Danny, and it was always a, a real thrill and a fun thing to get to see him ride. But when you had somebody like a Danny Magoo Chandler and Daryl Schultz, and guys that weren't leading points, but were, were always the first guys to do jumps, it changed the complexity of racing and forced the top guys to do shit that they didn't want to do. If you don't crash once in a while, you're not going fast enough. So uh, as soon as I signed up with Mako, we started getting fan mail. Uh, I'd never really gotten fan mail before. And uh, the secretary at Mako came, uh, came in the, the workshop and gave me this great big envelope with all these letters. I got to this, this like fourth or fifth letter and it was a teacher from Sacramento asking me if I would come to the grammar school and talk to these kids about my racing career. When we got there, there was a great big banner, you know, welcome Danny Magoo Chandler. And, uh, and I looked over at Billy and I said, oh my God, and these kids are serious about this. This was a school where kids were having a hard time reading and writing and studying. I was much the same way. In grammar school or high school, I couldn't pay attention. All I could think about was dirt bikes. Uh, so, you know, I could relate with these kids. I knew where they were. I gave the kids my testimony, talked about how I could not read or write very well, and reading dirt bike magazines, uh, motocross action and dirt bike, how I was able to help myself start learning to read and study. It was quite enlightening. It, uh, it made me feel good to go and educate the kids and help them, and, and in return, they helped me. I was addicted before then. I mean, I used to dream of riding every single night. I mean, all I did is think about riding, you know. Remember we used to walk the track and move the tires over so we could have a smooth line? Today's tracks are so much more well designed. I mean, I look at these pictures in the shop today and you see Carmichael and them upside down and I always wanted to get upside down, you know, but the, the jumps are designed so much longer and yeah. taller. But in the early days, it was just a mile of shit piled up and go <laughs> at it, boys, That's you know? Right. And we were doubling. I mean, they don't even like the flat land now, Brad. And everybody says about, you know, how tough it is now. And I go, well, how tough it was when we did it. And then I look back, just that little era right before me, when they were riding those oh, four strokes God. like that. 
45 yeah, minutes on the real tracks, you know? On those and those, those guys were the guys. But there was no little guys like us. Those guys were all giant, yeah. muscle. Fair drinking, <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget Southwick, where we ran, they had 125, 250, and 500 classes. And Southwick was notorious for getting really big bumps and really huge, and back then we ran 45 minute motos, and Danny crashed that second or third lap. His handlebar, I think it was his throttle, was bent down right next to his fork. He'd go wide open down the straightaway. He'd just get a mean head shake back and forth and just, Every lap, everyone just kept lining up to see when Magoo was going to step off, you know? I think he went from last to, like, top five. Never crashed again, you know? I think I think it probably been, you would have been better off to kick Danny's bike off the stand before it ever got on the starting line, bend the handlebars or something like that, and then he would have went out and won, won every race. It was scary. If you, if you had the balls to race side by side with Magoo, right next to him, eh, take your chances. <laughs> and sometimes it was pretty physical. Oh, good old days, boy. Good old days. Maybe in our next life we'll live them again. The <laughs> problem is that when, and you've, I think you and I have talked about this before, when you're in a sport, you're like motocross, you're very young and you are immature and you don't make good decisions at that age. And so these companies are able to pressure you into decisions that don't always, you know, fit your best interest. I'd gone to a lot of work to try to make the bikes competitive and in those days the European bikes weren't even close to being competitive to the factory Japanese bikes and so we had to go outside to outsource everything to make them competitive and right as we were really getting them competitive they stepped in and basically shut the door and said no we're not going to allow you to do that we don't want to run anything on the bike that's not factory OEM right You said you were done. And I said like, you know, all I could see, I was what, 17 years old? Yeah. And all I could see was the end of the ride. You know, there wouldn't be no tomorrow. You know, when you, uh, when you go out with your buddies and you play basketball or you, you know, you go running or you go swimming, you know, having friends is so important, you know, because you get out on the road, on the nationals, you only have a small group of people that you really live with. Oh, God, come on. Hit each other. Knock each other out. <laughs> we called Suzuki, and they sent us bikes and parts. And I had a Suzuki support ride in 1980, and I started riding Suzuki locally. The biggest memory I have from Junior Speedway, we had the, the Duckville visors on our helmets, which was the biggest, I think, the biggest Magoo thing ever. Magoo is the man, you know. I, one of my all-time heroes was Bob Hanna, and then Magoo was, was right there with it, and so it became, those were the two heroes of my, my motocross days and, as a kid. There's another one. That's Danny Chandler's Pit Tootsie. They all look like that. 1981, I get this phone call from Chicago, Illinois. My eyes hurt. Why? Going too fast. It was a guy, Lorenz Ochner. He owned a, a little company called LOP. And he asked me if I would like to come to Chicago and ride a Honda 500. And I said, yeah, certainly I'll do that in a heartbeat and rode the, the Trans Am. I believe it was a five race series. I won every moto of that five race series. As soon as that series was over, I got a phone call from American Honda asking me to come down and talk to them. And they negotiated with me to ride for Honda for two years. I believe it was like $80,000 a year that Honda agreed to pay me to ride for them. And bonus money uh, was $5,000 for every, every time I won a moto. And then $5,000 if you win the overall. I immediately signed that deal. Uh, it was the first time that I ever made that kind of money. It was probably the best thing that I ever did for my career. Honda was, uh, was a real good company to ride for. You know, you have Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, Kawasaki, and to be on one of those teams is, makes your career. And to get that is 
I think after that, if you can get a Honda ride, I think that's where you can say that you finally made it. Went from, you know, not winning a lot of races to being like the front runner in the 500 class immediately. He had an unbelievable ability, uh, just uh, could do stuff other guys couldn't on a motorcycle. You know, that year where it was just, you know, like he was on fire. The super bikers, you know, USGP at Carlsbad, I remember all that stuff, just killed everybody. That was a race that, uh, you know, I knew that I would be on TV. That race had a lot of prestige to it. Two weeks prior to the U.S. Grand Prix, I was practicing hard. I was burning like five gallons of gas a day, three days a week, you know, training hard. I was going to the river and go down to the rapids, and I would just swim in the rapids. You know, I wouldn't go nowhere. I'd just swim against the current. So I was training hard. I went to win the U.S. Grand Prix. And I, knew, I knew Danny wasn't a traditionally big trainer. But he had a way of going out and working, and you knew he was strong, and you could physically see it and watch him. It had been raining the night before, so it, I knew it was going to be muddy, and uh, I liked the mud. There's the checkered flag for Danny Magoo Chandler. I always wanted to be the first American to ever win it, but I was the third American to ever win it. Before me was Chuck Sun, and before that was Marty Motes, so. That was another good race because uh, Americans usually don't win that race that often. Well, I had won the first moto and by a long ways. And the second moto, I got a good start. Oh, that's the thing, when, you, when you're racing a guy like Magoo, you ought to be willing to put it all on the line or just accept your second. And I wasn't willing to do that. We grew up racing together. I'm going to bang bars with this guy every week. Danny came by, I think. I don't even think he had his goggles on. I think they were hanging around his neck. Danny Chandler, now having taken the lead, has removed his goggles and is racing around this very muddy course with his eyes exposed to anything that might fly into them. And I fell down. And my goodness, our leader has come right off. I picked up the bike and I kept falling over. I dropped the bike and I was just panicking. Either Danny won by a mile or Dina, or was winning by a mile, fell, and then charged back to second or third. You know what I mean? It was, there was never a, well, you're just gonna race with him for first place. It was rarely like that. He either kicked your ass or, or, or jumped off the track or, you know, so, something happened. And I kept telling myself I blew it. I blew it. If they finish in their present order, Chandler would be the winner with 15 points for his first place finish in Moto 1 and six points for fifth place in this one, a total of 21. It was enough to win. I got very fortunate for winning that race with a first and a fifth. I didn't to uh, think I would win the overall, but I did. You know, you know, like in 82 when he won the motocross and trophy to nations, I kind of read something in the magazine where he told the Kosher, I don't need no chest protector. You know, he's already knew he's going to win. You know, he's like dominated. Being elected to go on the motocross and trophy team was the epitome of racing. When I found out that I was going to go to Europe and represent America, it was like, you know, going to war. <laughs> I went to whip everybody's ass, and I would not lose. My father would always talk about that race and, you know, how much it meant as far as pride for, you know, the United States. Everybody was like, oh, what's Dan, you know, because he was so inconsistent. And it's such a political pick of who's on the team. and. You know, if he didn't crash, he was the fastest guy there. It was almost like he didn't even watch anybody else. He was just so much fun to watch. Just amazing, man. Then he was on a level of his own. He rode more like a European than he did an American. And we all knew that he could probably go to Europe and do a better job than any American that we've sent over. And he proved it. I mean, this place was beautiful. Apple trees everywhere. And uh, you could smell the fresh cut grass. And I was just like in heaven. There's Danny Magoo Chandler climbing up the hill, still with the lead. I said, there's bees here and there's loads of them. Not just one or two. There was hundreds of bees. 
And I said, I'm going to get stung. I, can, I know I am. There's the checkered flag. And the win is up. For the first heat, number three, Danny Magoo Chandler from Team USA takes the first spot. Holy smoke, it looks like number two, Johnny O'Mara, is going to get his second hole shot of the day. And Chandler's not too far behind at all. Honestly, I hated racing, racing against him. Not because he tried to take you out. He was just so intense, such a fierce competitor. The second moto, about 35 minutes into the race, I feel this thing hit me in the neck, and it stings me. All I could think about was that, you know, I would have a hard time breathing, and I would have to quit because two weeks or three weeks before, I got stung at Carlsbad, and I had to stop and get oxygen, and, and I pull into the pits, and I come almost to a dead stop, and I yell at the pit guys, oh, I got stung by a bee, and they said, you only got a couple laps to go, so I take back off, and I, I come around the next lap, and they got this sign out there that said, two laps to go, and I said, cool, I can make this, and uh, I came around the next lap, and it said four laps to go. So I held on, I mean, I made it that five more laps, I think it was, and I pulled into the pits, and you know, when you get stung, when you have allergic reaction, you know, you start itching everywhere, and uh, you can't breathe, and uh, so I grabbed this wire brush, and I start scratching myself, you know, and Roger DeCoster came running up with the medic. They had a, an injection, so I roll over and I drop my leathers, and they stick me in the ass with the shot. A few seconds later, I hear this guy yelling, dope, dope, the Americans are doing dope. Got stung by the bee, the FIM, thought he was on drugs because he's beating himself. And Oh my God, it was just a big chaos. The officials are there, they came over and grabbed the syringe from the medic. They didn't know that he was um, you know, really, really allergic to, to, to bee venom. And uh, it all worked out to where, you know, they figured out that I had got stung by a bee and, you know, all that. So. So we won the first race, the 250, both motos, and uh, they, Honda had a great big party. I started drinking, we were drinking beer and drinking wine and champagne. And I think Danny lived, lived life hard on the track and off. And uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes that's not good. And Roger came up to me and said, Danny, slow down on the alcohol. And uh, being the punk I was, you know, I looked over at Roger and told him, I said, Remember Joel Robert and all the old racers, they could drink and win races. I look back on it and it was wrong for me to say anything like that. So we got in the rent cars and we drove to Switzerland for the 500. I think I have a good chance today. I think it's just going to man on getting a good start. You know, if you don't get a good start, I think it's going to be a little bit harder to work back up you know, from the back because the, the track is so rocky. So all the Americans, all my teammates were were crying about where they were wanted to start. And I told Roger, I said, hey, I'll go first because I don't care where I start. And I was on the far outside, the worst place in the world to be. Full shot, gone. I never looked back, you know, ran away with it. Number three, Danny Magoo. Seems hard to imagine him being over in Europe and not being in the lead. Both motos, he just killed everybody. Then he goes over and wins the motocross and trophy to nations, just demolishes everybody. And so he was on, he was on the track to dominate. But once again, it was, it was feast or famine every time with Dan. Danny Magoo Chandler up on one wheel. He's celebrating because nobody has ever won all four motos of this international competition. I won all four motos and uh, did something that nobody had ever done and I feel really privileged about that today. It was a race that got me elected into the Motocross Hall of Fame, which I feel very fortunate to have done. Just wide open, just like he is on the track. I mean, you can tell personalities off the track. They, they crossed over to on the track and he was just somebody that did it, you know, to the full tilt on everything. <laughs> so, uh, after the races, uh, again, Honda had a celebration party. Everybody was drinking, drinking heavily. I'm getting all drunk. Dessert came and it was some kind of cream pie. I grabbed my pie and I, I smashed it in this guy's face. And uh, before he could do anything about it, I grabbed another piece of pie 
and I smash it in my own face, throwing pie everywhere and throwing bread and and uh, I let alcohol, you know, take over. I started using alcohol way too much. Danny and I grew up, I think, in similar circumstances that we didn't have a lot of money growing up and give him, you know, a white trash kid some money, he's gonna go blow it, you know, and he's, he's gonna be the big kid on the block. You know, up in the mountains there, and there's dune buggies and crashing things, and... I really need the mountains, yeah. I need to uh, go out and do my thing when I wanna do it. It will show you why they're called the Super Bikers. I was no stranger to this race. In 1980, I had rode the Super Bikers uh, on a Mako. You know, because his style is not precise. <laughs> And that type of racing took, uh, you know, a little bit of technique, a little calmness, throttle, you know, and Danny, of course, doesn't know anything about on and off on the throttle, so. About number 34 there, that's Danny Chandler, who came from last to first in his qualifying heat. Three major disciplines of motorcycle racing are drawn together. They come here, some of the best in the world, and they compete on a course that has been specially devised device to combine some of the elements of these disciplines, of road racing, of the dirt tracks, and of motocross. Ricky Graham still the leader, but now by a narrow margin over number 34, Danny Chandler. And now Jay Springsteen is moving into second place, ahead of Chandler, as you would predict. Again, the Harley Davidson on the long, fast straightaway. And there, he does get second back again from Jay Springsteen, does Danny Magoo Chandler. We've got Ricky Graham on the lead. Danny Magoo Chandler almost beside him now and taking the lead from him, in fact. Side by side, racing for the lead. How often have you seen that in a motorcycle race? And now it's Danny Chandler taking the lead. Taking the lead at last from Ricky Graham. Steve Wise had won it two years before, so they had a $50,000 bounty out on Steve Wise. Number one, Steve White, White taking the lead by the narrowest of margins. That one year, he was just scary fast. It was a scary event, and he just was all over the place. So uh... there they go. Now here's where Chandler's been making his move. I don't think this time. Well, here's where he made the move on the last lap. Oh, he looked the wrong oh. way. Steve White looked to his left in the rear, and Chandler went by him on the right. He didn't see him coming. And now they're getting the white flag. That means one lap to go. And it's definitely Chandler with the edge now. Danny, an absolutely brilliant ride. You have dethroned the king of the super bikers. How does it feel? Oh, really good. You seemed incredibly loose, particularly on the dirt. I mean, the rear of the bike was out at a 45 degree angle almost half the time it seemed. Weren't you ever worried you were going to lose it? So I made like, you know, $75,000 in one day, which was a lot of money in those days. Pretty wild, you know, he's one of the guys that would really get it flat and stuff. And then in nationals, whipping it really. And that was most of the biggest memories that I recall of, of Danny. He was always one of those guys that always remembered your name, always came up and said, hey, it didn't matter if you were in a heated battle or, or whatever. There was obstacles on the tracks that they were just starting to put in that people weren't clearing. And this guy went out and cleared him. He cleared him while he was cleaning out his carburetor in practice. Led the first moto at Saddleback and last lap got the white flag and, and there's a big uphill. They called it Bonsai, Bonsai uphill. And it was like a big triple and it kind of flat landed on the on the third wall and I fell down. My bike rolled back down the hill halfway and uh, I ran down the hill and I grabbed my bike and I hopped on it and I rolled down the hill and bump started it. Turned around and rode up and uh, I won the moto. I had uh, gotten disqualified for going backwards on the track. And like two weeks later, uh, I believe it was the 250 U.S. Grand Prix at Unadilla, New York. And uh, I won both motos. First moto, I ran away with it. Second moto, last lap. About 100 feet before the finish line, I turned around and I, I rode the bike across the finish line backwards. And uh, the crowd just freaked out. And the announcer, Larry Myers, 
come running down there with a microphone and I stated to him that a couple of weeks ago I got disqualified for riding backwards on the track and I just wanted to prove to AMA and the world that I could ride backwards on the track legally and I was pissed. Everybody, I wasn't the only one who, who had gone down that hill backwards. You couldn't start on the middle of the hill and keep going. You had to go backwards. There's times when my gut would wrench when I'd get next to him on the track because he was a loose cannon. A lot of people considered me the same way. Hannah had that, Bradshaw had it, Ricky Carmichael has it. That will that, screw it. I know I'm going past my ability, but getting hurt's not that big of a deal, but losing, I'm not going to lose. And when, when you uh, race against a guy like that or fight against a guy like that, you have to disable him. And a lot of times the only one who disabled Danny was himself. Two or three weeks later, I was supposed to go to Ohio for a meeting regarding me being disqualified. And I get a phone call from American Honda letting me know that I had to go to Ohio to this meeting. I said, do we have an attorney going to go? And they said, no. Well, is anybody from Honda going to go? And they said, no. I drive down to the airport. I walk up to the terminal. And uh, I don't know what came over me, but I turn around. And I said, you know what? If Honda doesn't care about a championship, then why should I? I turn around and walked out and came home. Well, about three days go by, I get this phone call from Honda yelling, you didn't go to that meeting. How come you didn't go to that meeting? I said, you guys didn't send an attorney. You guys didn't have nobody from Honda representing me. And if you think by me going to this meeting was going to change any of the outcome, I think you're wrong. So I didn't win a championship that year. I finished third. So be it. I really felt that if they really wanted that title, the 500 championship, that they would have somebody from Honda go with me. I should have won the championship, and I would have won it if I had not been disqualified. But I've known Magoo for a lot of years. Uh, I first met him in the early 80s. I was riding minis for Factory Honda and he was riding, you know, top pro guy. He was a free spirit and a guy that was, was more tapped in to going big than anybody I, I've ever seen in my life. You watched him on that 500 two-stroke and the guy just got it done. He was, he was truly off the chart, if I could say. When you look at the scope of like dudes who were mad dogs and guys that were all the way hung it out, Magoo, he lived up in the stratosphere of those feet. I had been riding with a buddy of mine, Rob Henry, who was a, a kid from Forest Hill. Didn't matter what he was doing, it was wide open, just go. We had gotten home from riding. Well, I had a little track in my backyard and uh, I kept riding my track. I don't really remember what happened, but I kind of remember I'd come off this jump and I got out on the outside in the weeds and there was a big rock in there and I hit this rock and it spit me up over the handlebars and I rode the front wheel right into this post and I hit the side of my face on this post. I had been looking for him for, shoot, five, 10 minutes and yeah, and I went down back to the property Looking back there, and I seen him hanging in the hanging in the fence, upside down. His bike was against the fence, and his feet were wrapped up in the hog wire, and he was hanging upside down over it. And he was blowing bubbles of blood out of his nose and mouth. And I guess I ended up breaking my jaw in two places, lost the hearing in my right ear, and I had three skull fractures, knocked out four teeth. I think that was into my career with Honda, to say the least. I was all wired shut for uh, four months. It was right before Christmas. I can remember eating Christmas dinner through a syringe. So I lost my Honda ride. 
They didn't want to renew my contract for 1985. I got this, I was sitting at home one day and I got this phone call from England and uh, he invited me to come to Europe and ride the uh, 500 world title. The 500 world championship was the, like the epitome of motocross, like now it's kind of like supercross, you know, 250 supercross or whatever. The European tracks were like road racing on the dirt. I told my wife at the time that, uh, hey, we're going to move to Europe. We got a house in England and we're going to go and race uh, in Europe. It's not a nice life in the rain. Danny's been over there. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. You know, California, you take it for granted. We got sunshine 300 days of the year. My boss at Kawasaki, the importer of England. Well, I stayed the night at his house. And that night, he tells me I can't win. I kind of was confused. What do you mean I can't win? I said, I just, I just won last weekend in Beaucaire. And he goes, oh, I know you can win races, but we don't want you to win races. And I said, well, then why are you hiring me? He goes, well, we want you to help George Jobe win the world title. He says, well, you have to ride behind him. And I said, so if George is in 10th place and I'm leading the race, I have to pull over and let him beat me? He goes, yeah. And I said, you got to be high, dude. I'm not going to waste another year of my career to do this. And he goes, well, that's what we're going to pay you to do. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it. So that next morning, I hop on the airplane and I fly back to America. I get this phone call. He goes, what are we going to do? And I said, well, do you know anybody at KTM? And I, he goes, yeah. And I said, oh, well, I'll ride at KTM. And he goes, KTM. And he goes, can you? And I go, yeah. And he goes, can you win on him? And I go, yeah. Like a day or two goes by and I get another phone call. He goes, hey, we got bikes. Well, they're going to give us the same amount of money and they're going to give you a box truck. They're going to give you a mechanic and uh, it's the same deal. Got used to the bike pretty quick. It was easy to get used to. Regarded by many as an excellent outsider to win this event is the American Danny Chandler. The last time the American rode in Europe was back in 1982 when he soundly trounced the opposition at the Trophy and Motocross the Nations. In 1985, he's riding on an Irish license for a British team on the Works Austrian KTM. In 84, I had a, a real bad year and I uh, lost a very good ride I had for American Honda. So I decided to come to Europe and it's also been, you know, uh, you know, something I've wanted to do since I was a little boy and I'm here and I like it. The last time we saw you was uh, Motocross the Nations and Trophy the Nations and uh, using an American Americanism, you whooped everybody. So I, I think the track here is good. It, uh, you know, suits me fine, it's rough and it's fast. And um, what would you be satisfied with today? Oh, a win. <laughs> I mean, you know. So it looks as if the United States will win here in France overall. It was a downhill jump thing and uh, kicked you going off. And just, you know, Italy, hard as rock, concrete. So, you know, when, it, when you hit the deck, you know, you did a big slap. And all I can remember was there's this great big jump and then a great big downhill afterwards and I was sailing off this hill. In the middle of the air the front end just dropped, went down and wadded up hard. It's spooky to race with him but it was, it was, it was wicked fun to watch him ride because you're just 110 percent. I uh, woke up in the hospital. My face is all tore up and uh, I had separated my shoulder. And I, I go back to the track and I want to see my bike, you know, how bad it was. And uh, they wouldn't show me the bike. And uh, I do a little bit of homework. That year, what it was doing was it was putting a bind on the, on the shock real bad. And it would break the shock shaft. What happened was when I came off that jump, I compressed into it and the bike bottomed out and it snapped the shock shaft. And the rear end just dropped out from underneath itself. Well, nobody told me about this. Nobody ever said there was a problem. So that ended that. I set out six races. I finished seventh in the championships, but I should have won it.
that no matter how deep you went into the corner, he would go 10 feet further. And <clears throat> sometimes it's nerve wracking because you don't know you don't know where he's come, where he's going to come from, which which is which played right into to his to his game. So Kawasaki approached me again. And uh, this time they let me know that England would not be involved with uh, this ride. When we were all done with that year, we were looking to make, uh, without winning one race, I was contracted for about $667,000 a year for the next three years to ride in Europe. Drove to Paris, France again and uh, broke my neck that night. It's a good time over there. It's not a serious event really, you know, so it's basically a lot of show up money and, you know, more fun, but, you know, we're racers and when you get on a bike, you still try to win. And I wasn't patient enough for Supercross. I wasn't a real good rhythm guy. I, I liked going fast. I really didn't know anything was going on until, uh, until the night was over. I hadn't seen any Americans for a year. So I got to hang out with all my friends. He was on a Kawasaki, and he was dealing with like an inner ear infection. His timing was was way off. I mean, he was charged, same Magoo as always, charging unbelievably hard, but his timing was weird. And he'd come into the corner and then gas it really hard in the middle of the corner, and then have to let off on the exit and then gas it again. And went to a disco, ordered up a bunch of drinks, and I mean, I got drunker than piss. Drinking hard, chasing girls. French girls are so beautiful. And we closed the disco down somewhere around three or four in the morning. Got like an hour and a half, two hours worth of sleep. And woke up that morning and I had the shakes real bad and I was wanting to throw up and my mechanic was there and I said, I don't think I can ride tonight. Uh, he says, no, you have to ride, you have to ride. So, you know, I forced myself to ride. It wasn't in his heat race. I was probably back in the ton, you know, the uh, pits after mine or something. And you know, you just heard that Danny crashed and um... got on the line, and I led the I led the qualifier for you know the first four laps or five laps, and I noticed at the finish line one of the journalists who was a photographer that was pretty well known. So I told myself at the finish, I'm gonna just do a big old whip. You know, let the stadium go go quiet, and went to do a cross. It was a little late. Missed the handlebar on the way down. Hit the bar. And, landed on the concrete. So it really didn't hit home until uh, that evening back at the, uh, you know, back at the hotel. We kind of got the, you know, the, we got the really bad news, so that was hard to take. You always knew he'd get hurt, but you never, I never thought Danny would be paralyzed. You know, he's one of those guys that always landed on his feet. I knew he'd get scratched up, knew he'd break arms and stuff like that, but when one of the craziest guys that pulls off some of the gnarliest shit gets paralyzed, it really, it makes you think of your own mortality. The fact of the matter is, though, that we don't take the chances he took. I mean, I think it spooked a lot of guys out in the sport. They started thinking that life, life was more important than just than just riding motorcycle. So the last lap, come across the finish line, and I'm throwing it all sideways, and I'm looking right down at him, and his camera flashes, and I, I get blinded. You know, I can't see for a second. And I'm coming back down and I grab for the handlebar and I miss it. I pulled the handlebar to the right and the bike veered left and I drove into the hay bale and just went over the handlebars and I don't remember much after that. having a hard time breathing and my body just went numb and I started feeling real heavy and everybody around me speaking French. I can remember the sirens because they're different sounding in Europe. I'm looking down and I see myself in the ambulance through the back windows of this thing and I can remember it was like going through a tunnel. I, I suppose it was an outer body experience. You know, from what I understand what that would be, I didn't realize I was paralyzed. I really didn't know anything was going on until, uh, until the night was over. Because, you know, he got a card off. No, you know, of course, the French pornos, nobody speaks English real well. And I was there alone. I didn't have nobody there with me. You know, it was real hard not, ha not having that security of somebody you knew with you, you know. It took like a week or two for my wife and my mom 
to get there. If it happened to me, I don't know how I would handle it. Don't know how I could handle it, if I could handle it. I was in the hospital in France for three weeks, and then we flew home and got admitted to uh, Santa Clara, which uh, was probably the best place in the United States to be for a spinal cord injury. You know, it's something that, you know, we all think about every day. I mean, you gotta respect these things. They're also they're a lot of fun, and we live our life through them and everything else, but they can be very dangerous, you know. Rehab was a hard process, learning to shave again, learning how to hold a pin, learning to transfer in and out of bed, learning how to take care of your bowels, your bladder, all the things that you don't even realize. And my parents called me and told me about the accident, and I was like, oh Christ, you know, and you know, we all know the injury, you know, the risk we take riding any kind of motorcycle that, you know, we all take that risk. When Danny got hurt, that was a, a big wake-up call for us. And uh, I helped Danny and Tracy bring a lot of their belongings back from, from Europe, you know, because I had the contacts with the airline, so I'd bring a lot of their luggage and, and like I say, personal belongings back for them through that hard time. And visited Danny down the Bay Area when he was in the, the spinal ward, so. I always thought that I would get better tomorrow. And every time tomorrow came, there was nothing getting any better, so it was it was hard. I uh, got out of the hospital. I was in Santa Clara for three months. When I was in Santa Clara, my mother got really sick. She went in for a test there at the hospital. A couple days later, the doctors called her in, and, and myself, and my father, and my wife, and uh, let us all know mother had cancer. You know, mom was diagnosed with cancer. I was paralyzed. You know, it was as, it was as if the world was falling apart. Uh, she made it three years and then she passed away. Uh, at that time, my wife and I were having troubles with our marriage. After I got hurt, I came out admitted, you know, I wasn't faithful in our marriage. Uh, she decided that uh, she wanted to be out of the marriage and uh, I don't blame her. It was for the better. Two years after my divorce, uh, three years after my mother's death, my father had a heart attack. He passed away, so. Oh, my dad was a wonderful, wonderful character. And he was a character, personality plus. I don't think that anybody's ever met my dad that didn't love him. And he loved motorcycles. He liked to race. I think that he lived through my brother at some, some point, because my brother could do what he just only dreamt of doing, because he only had one leg. Within five years, we had some, some rough water. I didn't want to live no more, so I started drinking again and doing dope. And you know, I was on a, I was on a mission to get it over with. And I knew that there was some form of a disconnect with Danny, but I didn't know he was partying that much. You know, he, he was like he was a private guy. And one day, there was this this little boy that came up to me and asked me if I would go and help him, you know, learn to ride. I think it's a true measure of, of his manhood, how, how he just keeps fighting. I went out and did a ride in school and worked with the boy and, and realized, you know, I saw myself through his eyes. And uh, I started to grow from there. Started doing more and more riding schools and started going to hospitals and talking to other people who have been injured, you know, broken necks or a broken arm, and to let them know that, you know, keep up what you were doing because it does get better. All you have to do is believe and strive to be your best, and you can be. Sometime when I was in Santa Clara, I kept having these dreams that uh, I wanted to be a car racer just because I was paralyzed and I couldn't be on two wheels there was no reason for me not to, to be on four wheels. Since Danny has no hand movement, he designed some special gloves that Velcro his hands onto the steering wheel. In the summer, Forest Hill gets too hot for Odyssey riding. And I pull straight back, throttle, left, 
right? And then I built this chest brace right here to uh, support me so I can. I'm able to pull the throttle back. Without it, then I just pull my whole self forward. Promote races now. I enjoy promoting dirt bike races and mountain bike races. Man, he's the one that makes it all possible up here, building the most radical courses I've ever seen. Let's hear it for Danny Magoo Chandler. Yeah. You know, I enjoy putting on races to benefit the community. I'm not a person that wants a lot of money. I'm a person who wants to help the community reap the benefits of events. Danny's a trooper and he's still going wide open and doing things he wants to do. And I can't really imagine any, anybody like him is going to come along again. You know, and I, I sit and I watch, you know, I watch TV today. You know, you watch freestyle, you watch motocross, and then you turn around on the same weekend and you watch car events, NASCAR or NHRA or any other type of motorsports. And, and you see that the rider representative, driver representatives are so much more in control of their sport where motocross and motorcycles is more of a, a free-for-all. Promoters are, and organizations are, are taking advantage of the riders. Uh, riders don't have the ability to come together and stand together. You know, you finish, you finish 20th place in the national championships or the world championships. You should be making at least $100,000 a year. If you're you in the national think, or the world championship, yes. Do you not yes. think that 20th place deserves a hundred grand a year? Uh, guarantee. Should be a guarantee. Before a 1985 racing accident left Danny Chandler in a wheelchair, the man known to race fans around the world simply as Magoo took motocross to new heights. During his own racing career, Danny Chandler was known worldwide as one of the most fearless and skilled riders in the sport of motocross. Now as a coach, he sees a lot of himself through the eyes of young Brett Racine. Very much. Very much. I know where he's at, mentally, physically. Basically, we were counselors at his camp, and we'd go in there and he'd have us first thing we do when we got there in the morning was run around the track twice. Thought, you know, what kind of motocross school is this? And it's like a drill, basically, like you're in the military. He'd have you out there with one hand on your helmet, both feet off your pegs, riding on the trails. And for what reason, I didn't know back then. By the time the end of the day rolls around, you ride the same trail with all your hands and feet on it. You realize how good he really was at teaching people. Now, we're going to talk a little about safety. It's really important. Now, Danny, why don't we uh, kind of describe some of the stuff that Kevin's wearing for well, safety? We, uh, on his knees, we're wearing EVS. When we first started doing it on all our schools, the first thing he would basically tell everyone is safety comes first. I'm 16, and I ride 125 Novice. It was a lot of fun. We learned how to ride in the mud. We learned coordination. And he's not really like a teacher. He's just like a normal guy, you know. He's He'll tell you, like, straight up, like, if you're messing up or anything, it taught me a lot. You know, that's good to see. It's always good to see him stay close to the motocross community and where, you know, where he grew up. And even though he got hurt doing it, he's not staying away and still pushing the sport. And that's what it's all about. So many parents are, are living their life through their kids, and they're pushing their kids a little bit too hard to succeed. So the message to the parents is not to live your life through your child. Yeah, two fingers, two fingers on the brake. Good boy, good boy. Because you're going to damage them. And when you do, you're going to regret it. And if they want it, they'll get it. You know, you can't, uh, you can't push too hard. For the role he's played in, in American motocross and motocross in general, he, he, he needs a stronger position because it was, it was guys like him that sold tickets. No matter where he was on the track, it didn't matter, like I said, it didn't matter if he was winning a race or if he's in last place. He was giving it 110% and charging, and, and people were cheering, you know? Black, white, red, brown, everybody loved Magoo. You either hated him or loved him. You hated him because he was jumping on top of your, the guy that you wanted to win, 
or you loved him because he was picking his ass up off the ground and charging him back to the front. And that's that's what our sport's all about. And he and he was the epitome of just give it all you got. I mean, shit, his name says the best, Magoo. I tell a lot of kids, you know, your body is your vehicle. And when you become 50, 60 years old, you're gonna need a good vehicle to get you around. And if you have thrashed your vehicle while you're young, you're gonna regret it. Now, there's a couple guys out there that push it like Magoo did, but, you know, in a different way. They, you know, they're still thinking long-term or whole season. Magoo was thinking every lap and every moto, and he wanted to win or lead every one of them. And that was, you know, it's a different kind of rider. I don't think we'll ever see it again. I'm often asked, would you do it all over again? And that's, that's a funny statement, because of course I would do it all over again, but I would, I would think a little bit more about the risk I take, and I definitely would think about the preparation that is necessary to be the best. Those were issues that I never thought about. The rear of the bike was out at a 45 degree angle almost half the time it seemed. Weren't you ever worried you were gonna lose it? No, I never was worried I'm gonna lose it. I was just, you know, pushing my limit, and I guess that's what you gotta do to win. If you don't crash once in a while, you're not going fast enough.